Bom dia a todos. É, bom dia aos sobreviventes aí. Estamos começando o terceiro dia do nosso 23 terceiro seminário internacional de defesa da concorrência do IBRAC. É, dentre as excelentes ideias que o presidente Caminati teve para tornar mais especial essa edição do nosso seminário, está o convite para o professor William Kovacic passar a semana conosco aqui. E eu tenho essa satisfação pessoal de poder fazer a apresentação dele para a conferência. É, na verdade, nós havíamos planejado que o uh, ex-presidente do CAD, Gésner Oliveira, fizesse essa apresentação, mas quando nós fomos convidá-lo para fazer isso, infelizmente, ele já tinha um outro compromisso. Mas nós tínhamos pensado nele justamente porque o Gessner foi quem trouxe o Kovacic para o Brasil pela primeira vez. Isso aconteceu em agosto de 1998. Uh, e, para mim, uh, foi o, o, o meu primeiro contato uh, com o professor Kovacic, porque após passar uma semana no CAD, uh, conversando uh, com os conselheiros da, da época, sobre desenvolvimento, defesa da concorrência, que é algo que ele faz bastante pelo mundo afora. Ele foi para São Paulo participar de uma das aulas do professor Gesder, da AGV, e eu, que tinha acabado de voltar do PINCAD, o professor Gesder convidou para participar dessa aula, e eu tive o prazer, e lembro muito bem dessa aula. O professor falava sobre a organização institucional dos órgãos de defesa da concorrência versus reguladores setoriais. E, tendo tanto tempo, vim quase 20 anos dessa data, eu lembrar bem, mostra a didática e o impacto que o professor causa nos alunos, ainda que os alunos, por um dia, como eu fui, então, uma satisfação muito grande para mim, pessoal, estar aqui. O professor Kovácio, que foi a minha primeira referência internacional. E estou muito feliz de ter conseguido dar certo do professor estar aqui. Muito bem. O professor Kovácio dispensa a apresentação. Na verdade, nas palavras do Juliano Basile, que é um jornalista importante aqui no Brasil, o professor Kovacic é uma instituição para o antitrust internacional. Ele é professor na Universidade de George Washington e foi, além disso, comissário e chairman da Federal Trade Commission dos Estados Unidos. E se o antitrust fosse uma religião, nós poderíamos tranquilamente dizer que o professor Kovacic é um profeta. Ele roda o mundo pregando a importância da defesa da concorrência para o vigor econômico dos países e foi contratado e deu consultoria para dezenas de países na implantação ou na reforma dos seus respectivos sistemas de defesa da concorrência. Além disso, o professor Kovacic, se vocês fizerem o que eu fiz essa manhã só para conferir algo que eu já sabia, de estarem antitrust no, da Amazon, uh, na categoria livros, é um dos primeiros hits. A obra do a Nutshell, do professor Kovacic. Então, ele realmente dispensa qualquer tipo de apresentação. Nas palavras do uh, Juliano Basile, é realmente uma instituição. E nós temos uh, somos muito gratos por ter a oportunidade de ter o professor aqui, conosco durante a semana, tem sido muito proveitoso, é, e com isso eu passo a palavra para o professor, que vai falar sobre um tema absolutamente atual para a realidade brasileira, concorrência, é, corrupção e licitações públicas. Thank you, Marcio. I think that all of you may realize that those of us who have the opportunity to work with you learn more from you than you do from us. 
Uh, unmistakably, it has been a bilateral education and enrichment. And as anyone who's been a teacher knows, one of the great pleasures of being at Vargas that day and spending time with you, with Jesner, is to see the vision of a better life, to see the promise of the future in the faces of capable, hardworking, dedicated, enthusiastic young people. Young people have become a bit older, but indeed, <laughs> uh, uh, indeed are, the, are, the, are the very foundation of a, of a good system. And yesterday, again, we saw that in the faces of all the young people uh, who were here. Uh, and that gives you a sense of hope and confidence that brutally difficult problems can be addressed successfully. So uh, thank you for the inspiration you give back to all of us. Uh, if you had had uh, an auction for the program, I would have bid a lot to, to, to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, competition, uh, corruption, and public procurement. Uh, and to go about it uh, basically in the following way, I want to talk a little bit about where car wash fits into the larger global program of competition law cases and to underscore for you why I think it is an especially important matter, not just for Brazil, but for the larger global community. Uh, to then say a bit about why we care so much about procurement, why there has been a decided trend, and I would say the past 10 to 15 years, on the part of competition agencies to devote more resources to this field of interest and to treat it as an ever more important priority. Uh, to then speak about the difficulties associated with being active in this area and taking on issues that implicate systems of public integrity and to look at corruption as a collateral focus of competition law, why that is difficult and in many instances dangerous and particularly hard for a competition system to take on, and then to offer some suggested solutions about how to make involvement in this area very important. My general observation and conclusion is that this is a most worthy area for public authorities in the field of competition law to be active, and that there is a strong potential anti-corruption dividend that comes from the enforcement of competition laws involving misconduct in the area of public procurement, but nothing about it is easy. I don't think I have to convince this audience of how difficult the engagement in that area of the work is, because it brings the competition authority into a neighborhood that is very rough, very difficult, where the sensitivity of everything it does is accentuated. Uh, so this is an area that I would call very high perspective gain, but very great danger as well, and potential loss. But I'll talk about how to realize the gains, but to mitigate the hazards of doing that. Um, I'm giving you my views only, uh, not those of the Competition and Markets Authority in the United Kingdom, but my views are very much shaped by my experience working with that excellent agency and looking at the increasing effort they are dedicating to working with public procurement officials and with public prosecutors who have a mandate to deal with corruption and serious fraud. Uh, in going about this, uh, I'm drawing on, on work with a number of colleagues. Uh, Rob Anderson at the World Bank, Alison Jones, my colleague at, uh, at King's in London, uh, Marianella Lopez Galdos, uh, uh, one of my PhD students, who's now working with a think tank in Washington, but is doing lots of work with Allison and I in this area. Uh, and Anna Caroline Mueller, uh, who's Rob's colleague at the World Bank. Uh, I think it's no accident, again, that you see increasing collaborations involving researchers who are interested in, separately, corruption, competition law, public administration, and public expenditures. Uh, this has been an encouraging area where you've seen a convergence of interests and collaboration across disciplines, political science, economics, law, public administration, uh, that is not natural or inevitable in the field of research, but you see those collaborations taking place at more and more academic hubs around the world with, I think, fruitful results for policymakers, some of which I'll identify for us uh, today. Um, uh, where, does, where does car wash stand in the larger scheme of our experience with competition law? 
I'd assert to you it's one of the most important cases that any agency anywhere at any time has ever brought. Uh, for several reasons, how to measure, uh, what's at stake. Uh, at home, not simply the performance of the public procurement process, but arguably the performance of the political system itself. The case goes to the very heart of government decision making and the relationship between public and private actors. I don't think that Kaje thought that's where it was going when it opened this door. But that's where the path has led, right to the heart of governance in the country. So much so that it is a case like any, unlike any other that an agency has brought that calls into question the entire system of governance as well as the functioning of a key area of public expenditure. That would be plenty right there. That would pay the rent in terms of importance. But notice the extraordinary spillovers across the entire region. This has not simply become a matter of interest for Brazil, but count for yourselves the number of countries in Latin America that have been deeply affected, the huge ripples that have spilled across the border into other jurisdictions where the identification of this conduct has set in motion inquiries involving other jurisdictions where the same actors were involved and potentially with the same effect on the political process. That is what could happen in a chain reaction like way across the continent is a re-examination of governance and the re-examination of the way in which governments collect money, spend it, and the way in which public institutions function. That's an extraordinary accomplishment. Last, as we have been hinting, as Richard and I mentioned earlier, this is a matter of global concern. Not to be too dramatic, but I'd assert to you that competition agencies across the world are following this intently. They're following it because of the economic significance of the case itself, but they're seeing day by day what happens when the anti-corruption machine starts to run and how it can put the competition agency in a very sensitive and delicate realm of policymaking and how it can set in motion various political forces that in some ways can endanger the operation of the competition system. So I tell you in my conversations just within the past six months, the number of heads of agencies who've said, we watch this all the time. And yes, in part it scares us because we're not quite sure how we will formulate a program that will enable us to withstand the kind of backlash that inevitably comes when you take on matters that are so fundamental and difficult. So this is a matter not just important for Brazil, for the hemisphere, but for the global arena of competition agencies. As Richard and I suggested before, if you look at the experience with competition law since 1990, 100 new systems, pause for a second, that hasn't happened in any other area of economic policy making. We've never had a setting in which so many countries in such a short period of time have either adopted new laws in a particular area or dramatically reformed older laws. There's no parallel for this in the field in which we're interested and active. And within that arena, there are a handful of jurisdictions and systems that stand out for the way in which they have been able to make progress and succeed in initial conditions that were not entirely favorable. It's a handful you're familiar with. It's South Africa and the continent of Africa. It is Brazil here. It's Mexico. It's Chile in Latin America, to take just a few here. But to go into Asia, it's Singapore. In South Asia, what will happen with the renovated system in India? Indeed, it's China. But it's a small list of countries that in many ways are benchmarks. They're bellwethers. They're barometers for how the system is developing. In this region, if competition law cannot succeed in Brazil, it will not succeed in the continent. And if Brazil can't be successful, there's real doubt about whether it will work in the other 99 and to be successful there. So in this arena, what happens here is examined very carefully abroad, especially this case. So where would I put this case in terms of its importance today? I think it is as important as any other case being run anywhere else today. 
Uh, we could have a debate about Google, for example, which is important for the future of the IT system and competition law. It's a worthy contender for the honor of being the most important, no doubt. But I'd be willing to stand on a platform with anyone and say, for the reasons I've just mentioned, car wash is as important as that case today. In other words, no more important case in the world uh, today. Um, uh, years ago, I, I read an interview uh, given by the curator for the Heritage Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, and he's interviewed by a journalist who says, uh, do you have the best collection of art in the world? He says, well, there are a lot of good ones, a lot of great museums, it's hard to say. And he paused and said, I can assure you of one thing, we are not the second. Uh, I would assure you in one thing, uh, car wash is not the second. Let's even take a broader perspective and ask, since 1889 with the first national experiment with competition law in Canada and carry it forward today, how many cases anywhere at any time have been more important than this one? We don't know how this one ends yet. There's a long way to go, but Standard Oil of New Jersey, Hoffman LaRoche, take your pick, Constant, Grundig, which cases are more important? Formulate your own top 10. I think you can make a strong case that this is a top 10 case of all time, given the stakes involved and what it can, can mean. So this is no small matter for an agency that is barely 25 years old. This is a big deal. Uh, why do we care about procurement? Uh, why is it an especially important arena in which to consider questions of competition and questions of corruption? The first and foremost is the money. It's huge. It's immense. Depending on the jurisdiction, total GDP expenditures running from 10% of all GDP up to 40 or 50% in some countries. Um, in my country, it's about 17% of GDP. What's GDP? It's about $16 trillion. That's a lot of money. And what happens when there's a lot of money lying around to be spent? Who's interested? Public officials and the firms that will receive the funds. And you have the possibility for all kinds of unseemly arrangements that will determine where the money goes. There's just so much of it. And by nature, it tends to be spread through expenditure that takes place in such a decentralized way that there are many openings for corrupt bargains to be made. It's hard to monitor. There's so much of it, and it is so attractive. In a sense, for a bank robber, it's the biggest bank there is that's readily accept accessible. Uh, second, the economic harm, if you screw it up, is enormous. The possibilities for harm where the funds are being spent for crucial infrastructure projects. You're building the schools, you're building the hospitals, the roads, the ports, the airports, and you're providing vital social services for things such as national health care systems. You're buying medicines that determine whether or not people live or die. You're buying texts for students in school, you're purchasing, in many instances, vital infrastructure, investments, and social services. You know about the debate about whether competition law cares enough about inequality, whether it should do more to correct instances of economic disadvantage. You're familiar with that debate. To the extent that competition law has been interested in this, and it has for a long time, it's been there. Where can you find an area where so systematically distortions in the way the money has been spent adversely affects the second half of the demographic with respect to income and other crucial sources of individual growth and mobility? I would suggest to you that the areas in which the misspending of funds have been so damaging land most heavily on the shoulders of the have-nots rather than the haves. Schools healthcare programs, vital infrastructure investments. Yes, do people of means gain some, get some benefit from that? 
Was I delighted to walk through the airport in Las Campinas to see the renovated airport in Brasilia? You bet, and with envy. Living in a third world country as I do, with a third world airport called Dulles International Airport, I can assure you, <laughs> and there are others, LAX. I'm sorry to use these curse words for a, an audience here. JFK. Um, I'll stop doing this. These are, these, are, these are vulgar terms known well to all of you. Uh, it wouldn't be worth it if it weren't for the generous and friendly disposition of our immigration officials. Uh, so do come back. Uh, it is, yes, the, the, those of us at the upper echelons of the income spectrum, we benefit from that. But far and away, in most instances, the people who get it right in the neck if the procurement system fails or the people who are dispossessed or have less. So, tremendous economic harm and I would say especially serious harm for people of lesser means or serious disadvantage. Last, if this system fails in a vivid way, there's nothing that more effectively entrenches cynicism about the functioning of government than wasting the money. Why? People pay taxes. That's a sensitive issue. They see money collected by governance, and if they see it thrown away, if they see it skimmed, stolen, ripped off, what do they think about their government? Two things. Everybody cheats. It's all corrupt. And nothing that public officials do is honest. And if there's a bit of it, there's a suspicion that everybody's in on it. If you want to entrench a view of public administration that says it is worthless, that it can't do the job well, watch the money get stolen and misapplied. It takes a long time for a government to build trust with its citizens, doesn't it? To create a sense of confidence that these people are serving our interests. It takes one episode of misconduct to liquidate that pool of goodwill, it's gone in a minute. And try to fill the vessel back up again and how long it takes. I'll give you an example of this. This is Fat Leonard. <laughs> Fat Leonard is Leonard Francis. He is a Malaysian citizen who operates a shipping services company that provides assistance to vessels as they travel through Asia. Among the many vessels who do that are American warships and supply ships. He began by cultivating relationships with US procurement officials to induce them, among other things, to locate ships in ports where he had service facilities. In part, he said, I provide good services, but what were the crucial means for his persuasion? Envelopes filled with $100 bills, the most popular currency of corruption around the world. The 100 is pretty nice. Most places will cash it for you. Banks will take it. There's a $1,000 bill, but that looks a little bit suspicious. The 100 is right in the sweet spot. Big envelopes of $100 bills. Luxurious trips with the most elegant hotels, and accommodations, food, beverage that you can imagine, and of course, in the grand tradition of corruption, prostitutes, <laughs> teams of them. Who were they provided to? They were provided to US naval officers, senior officers, who would give Fat Leonard data about your US warships were traveling. By the way, that isn't posted on the front page of newspapers in the United States. That's sensitive information. Where the submarine's going, where the aircraft carrier's going, that's not a matter of public record. That's very sensitive. Fat Leonard bought that. And by giving inducements to naval officers and top officials would induce them to port the vessels where he was. Estimates of how much he stole over a period of 10 years, probably at the low side, 200 million, maybe as much as 400 million people still working on it. 
Uh, who are the victims? I'm going to show you a photograph of Commander Mike Misiewicz. Mike Misiewicz, in many ways, is a remarkable and ennobling human being. He was able to escape the deprivations of Pol Pot in the last days of the slaughter in the killing fields in Cambodia. He got out. He comes to the United States. He's adopted by a family. He works hard. He goes to good schools. He gets into the Navy and becomes the commander of a major warship. He makes a famous visit back to Cambodia, where for the first time he returns to his country as a naval officer, and he is greeted by friends and relatives for the first time. It's an astonishing clip of tape that shows the local boy making good and coming home after a horrible ordeal where he ultimately succeeds. He is seduced by Fat Leonard. Fat Leonard pays him off and takes him on a horrifying path. This is Mike. That's Mike in a bordello. He is surrounded by a group of young women, not his wife. <laughs> he seems to be having a good time. Who paid for it? Fat Leonard. And Fat Leonard did this with one individual after another. It became known, they were prosecuted. Mike's in prison now along with a half dozen other senior naval officers from the rank of captain commander up to a one-star admiral. This ran for over a decade. And imagine what it does to the public confidence, and this is right off of the front page of the Washington Post some months ago. When people see that, and they look at this guy, and they see what's happened, try to persuade someone that Procurement at the Department of Defense is not corrupt, shot through all the way. Try to persuade them that this is all world worthwhile. Uh, this is what you get when the system goes bad. It's fatal, it's poison, and it's hard to recover. How can competition law push back? Um, first and foremost, it can attack the collusive schemes that are very popular and have been since the beginning of time dealing with public procurement. The early competition law cases brought by the Department of Justice feature a striking number of bid rotation schemes. You win this one, I win the next one, our friends win the third, then we go back and repeat the cycle again. Standard arrangement. To the extent the competition law can attack those directly, that's a valuable way of avoiding a serious distortion in the way governments purchase goods and services. Another key element of many competition laws is this specific prohibition that says the government shall not give exclusive rights, except in unusual circumstances, to individual providers. It won't do it. A good example from the government of Georgia, uh, Within the, in the, within the first five years of the operation of the Georgian competition law. They heard a complaint from a company that wanted to provide services at the main airport in Tbilisi, basically a gift shop. They wanted to open a shop, and they were told by the airport authority, sorry, we've got one. What do you mean you have one? We've given an exclusive franchise to one company. They went to the Georgian Competition Authority, which goes through the text and says, ah, there's a specific provision that says the government cannot do that. They brought it to the attention of the agency, they brought it to the attention of the Justice Ministry, and the contract was dissolved. What do you suppose sat behind that agreement? Was this just a neutral tendering process where they happened to pick the best? There was a bribe there. And what did the competition law do? It basically said you can't enforce the bribe. You can't enforce the contract. Now it's an illicit contract, this wouldn't be in the courts. But indirectly, the application of the competition law struck specifically at a corrupt scheme behind the airport authority and a specific firm that had said, I'll pay you. I'll kick back money if you give me the exclusive rights. And a competition law might not be intended initially to have that effect, but when it comes to the behavior of public agencies, that can be a valuable side effect of the operation of the law. The role as advocate. 
telling procurement authorities how to do their job better, telling the government to be suspicious of grants of exclusive rights where they aren't dictated, where they're not necessary, explaining to them what happens when you engage in behavior that's going to give a chokehold to individual suppliers. Uh, one of the early projects I worked on was in Morocco. And we were looking at areas in which there were possibilities from growth. We spent a lot of time talking to Moroccan agricultural firms that grew ornamental flowers. Pretty flowers, and the aim was we're gonna put them on airplanes, send them to the continent in Europe, and the next day they'll be sitting on the tables of Europeans, they'll be in offices, they'll be in displays, and we can make really nice flowers. But we're having a lot of trouble. First, we are facing what looks to be a trucking cartel that dramatically raises the price of getting to the airport. Two, there is an airport freight forwarding service that is licensed by, yes, the public airport authority, and there's one of them. They've given a single license so that for everything related to freight forwarding, arranging insurance, doing the packaging, dealing with customs, there's one. And it means that when we finally do get our flowers on the plane and offload it in Europe, we're facing a stunning cost disadvantage, 20 to 30 percent, that means that, yes, we sell some, we make really good flowers, but the volume falls way off. We did a bit of a study of this and said, if you, if you don't eliminate this cascade of restrictions, the private trucking cartel, the publicly encouraged monopolist operating at the airport in Rabat and Casablanca, you will not realize the growth and expansion of this sector, especially on the public airport arrangement. Where did the exclusive contract come from? It was a kickback. The party granting the contract provided a kickback. This was in the day before the Moroccan agency had really begun to function as a self-standing institution, but assisted in doing a study that told the government, if you don't want this ag sector to grow, if you don't care about growth, then do nothing. Leave it in place, please, don't touch it. But if you'd like to see this sector expand, we have some ideas about how to do it. And the competition agency, as a research instrument, put very useful information in front of the government. They changed the policy. Could they compel the change? No. But the basic question posed in their, in their report is, would you like to be richer or poorer? Would you like the country to be richer or poorer? It's just like that. It's not a trick question. And in the abstract, many people say, richer is better. Yes. And that was the choice, ultimately, that the government made. It's not that governments always, when confronted with powerful, compelling, empirical evidence, will make wise choices. But it makes it harder to explain away a manifestly irresponsible decision when you put those numbers on the table and let people stare at them for a while. Explain to me in a page of paper why poor will be better here. And it's not an acceptable answer to say, our friends, buddies, and companions are getting kickbacks that make this work. The last thing for an agency is that uh, it can dramatically assist in raising its profile with society in a way that creates support. Competition law, what does it mean? Who does it? How many citizens understand it? It's very sobering to see how hard it is to bring that across. One of the only ways that you can build that awareness is to do things that people understand. It's interesting to watch the way that the Department of Justice Thank you for your technical assistance. It's wonderful, an oasis, and suddenly there's the lovely water. That's much better. Uh, the Department of Justice, uh, and this was, this was part of, Mar Mar Marcelo went through some of this history on the first plenary session uh, uh, on, on Wednesday. The Department of Justice gets a greatly augmented criminal enforcement mandate in 1974. It converts the, the offense from what's called a misdemeanor to a felony. The felony is more serious. It means, among other things, you can't vote again. You're excluded from voting in elections. There are a whole host of jobs you can't have. Now, the misdemeanor was bad enough. If you're interfering for a job, 
and you see a line on the resume, convicted of a misdemeanor, and the employer says, what's this about? You say, oh, it's only a misdemeanor. Uh, it's a minor criminal offense, but I think I'm worthy of a position of trust with your law firm. The misdemeanor offense was not an attractive career-boosting feature. The felony was much more deadly serious, and it came with more severe criminal penalties. So the law's been upgraded. How do you put it into place? Because I think in every country, and by the way, only a handful have made good on the promise of criminal enforcement. You can count them like this and have a couple of fingers left over. 30 systems in the world today with criminal sanctions, maybe three or four that are making progress and making it work. Maybe. Why? It's a hard social norm to get across. When people think of serious crime, what do they think about? They think about people with ski masks, revolvers, and bank robbery or human trafficking in slaves, things of that kind, serious, serious offenses to individuals and to property, to human safety. Price fixing, what's that? Why should I care? I've got the bank robbers, the terrorists, the drug dealers over here, and there's a big queue of them, and you want me to spend time on price fixing, antitrust? Where's the public, popular support going to come from? And part of what the Department of Justice was concerned with in trials, jury trials, is convincing them that it mattered. Because who was the typical defendant? It looked like me, an old guy, no tattoos, very humble suit, short haircut, going gray, sitting there, threat to society? No. And the lawyer would say, do you want to put Bill in jail for this obscure offense? Why? And to throw him into a pen with the real bad guys, does that make sense? And the concern was a lot of jurors would say no. Or if they said yes reluctantly, the judge would say, two-year sentence suspended. And instead, you can give speeches to students in high school about the glories of capitalism. Do that instead. That was the common concern. So how do you persuade jurors, prosecutors, and others to push these cases? The brilliant strategy of the Department of Justice was public procurement first. What were their earlier cases in the 70s where they built a norm? And they brought lots of them. Road paving, but best of all, milk for children's school programs for breakfast and for lunch, milk, dairies. So here's Bill from the dairy company, and here's the prosecutor. There's Bill. Bill's telling you he's just a humble guy who got trapped in a maelstrom, didn't know what he was doing, and even if it was wrong, you don't want to put him in jail. Take a better look at him. He's taking milk away from your little children who will not have good nutrition, your money. No, he doesn't have a 32 and a ski mask, but he robbed you. He's taking your tax money. Do you like paying taxes, jurors? No? Look at him from the little children. That's what he did. Uh, DOJ starts getting convictions in these cases. Another early case involved bid rigging on the sale of uniforms and shoes to the US military. Here the argument was, your son, your daughter, off in some godforsaken place, you don't see them. They don't have good shoes because of this guy. Somebody sitting in a radar station in the Aleutians where it's really cold in the winter, you know, really cold, seven, eight degrees, no, 20 or 30 below, really cold, doesn't have a good coat because of this guy. That's why, doesn't have blankets. You want to feel sorry for him? You can do it. Guilty. Judge, three years. No suspended sentence. No talks to high schools. Nothing like that. So they built a norm of acceptability by bringing lots of these procurement cases where the themes were, it's your money, it's theft, and the harm is great, immediate, and you can understand it right away. And to others, do you know why you're driving on roads that look like the surface of the moon? It's this guy because we can't afford better infrastructure because of what he's doing. Jury's convicted. 
And there was a momentum de de developed that this was bad behavior. It was a great way to popularize the program because people understood what the misconduct was. This wasn't a merger involving some complicated intermediate industrial input to some larger, more complicated industrial process that ultimately produced a product that you understand. People got it right away. And jurors peered into the souls of these people and said, guilty. OK, that's why it's a good idea to be active here. Why press? collusion cases in an arrangement in an area where when you open the door and you start marching in, you're going to bump into the kinds of unseemly arrangements between private actors and public officials. There is a sign at the frontier that says, landmines, be careful, because you are tampering with the very forces of evil in the political process, and if you're not careful, you will atone for it. If you plan to upset corrupt bargains, deep-seated, like Fat Leonard's, that was just one, paying off lots of people, if you do this in a serious way, the empire will strike back. The empire does not welcome you and say, ah, you got me. I surrender. I give up all the power I've accumulated. I give up the income stream. It's about time someone found me out. That's not the reaction. People dig in and resist. Uh, Indonesia is a good example. The Indonesian Competition Authority, the KPPU, over the past year or so has brought two cases involving import cartels. And when they began, they thought they were looking at a straightforward import cartel that restricted shipments into the Indonesian market. Not remarkable. The hang up was at customs. Part of it was people trying to ship in found that their stuff, the container, just sat there in the holding pen in the customs area. A week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, a month, six months, a year. I can't get my stuff out to sell it. Why was that happening? Well, what did the import cartel do? It went to the customs agency and said, we will pay you to let our stuff in and to keep other stuff out or to let it in and let it sit on the docks. We'll pay you a lot. Although it's interesting, by the way, to see how cheaply some people sell out. In Fat Leonard, um, naval officers with wonderful careers gave it all up for $10,000 and a great week in Bangkok. Um, it's like going into a bank, in my mind, and going in with the ski mask and the revolver saying, give me $37. <laughs> No, give me $37 million. But uh, in this instance, they sold out pretty cheap. But they did. It was the customs agency that was keeping the goods out. They discovered this, and they kept marching along. Well, who was behind the customs agency decision? It was a ministerial decision that said, yes, this will be the favored importer. And we support you. And by the way, if you can share some of what you're getting with us, higher up in the chain, we'll be happy with that. They brought two of these cases. This is an embarrassment to the top leadership of the country. And what has the head of state done? He said, I propose to the parliament that we have a reform of the competition law, and we will go through the law, and every place that it mentions, the KPPU, they will be excised. We'll take them out of the law. I'll leave the substantive provisions in place, but we are going to eliminate the entire apparatus and machinery for enforcement by the KPPU. The KPPU will disappear. It's gone. What will I do, the president? I will adopt an executive regulation that creates a new competition agency. And who will it work for? Me. They'll be right there where I can see them. I'll pick them, they'll work for me. And that way we won't have these awkward and unfortunate enforcement episodes that we've just had here that tend to be embarrassing. Fortunately, the Indonesian parliament is fond of the competition authority. They like the way the work they're doing here. They have resisted this. But if you ask the leadership of the KPPU, does this concern you? Yes. This is a shot right at our heads. And we have to frantically work 
within the limits imposed on us in lobbying our own government, we have to work very hard to make the case to be left where we are. We have friends in the parliament, thank goodness. But the consequence of bringing these two cases involving import cartels, where they thought they were looking at a relatively straightforward collusive scheme to restrict entry, tends to have been motivated ultimately, the cartel, by a corrupt bargain. And by pursuing both of those, they have brought the acrimony of the head of state upon them, who would like to put them out of business. Oh, by the way, does he justify it by saying, you endangered arrangements that my friends in government have liked, that the ministers liked, and I want you to leave them alone? No, this is uh, careless public policy making. It's not coordinated with the larger interests of the government, so we have to control that over time. So if you're gonna enter this arena and start dealing with bargains that threaten, if they are upset, existing arrangements that have deep political ties and protection, you're entering a really tough neighborhood. You're going into the box in a soccer match. And when you watch carefully what happens when they go up for a header, a little bit of this, a little bit of that right in the head when nobody's watching, Nothing like getting a shot right to the head there to make you a little bit dizzy and not quite able to, hey, there are three balls coming at me. Which one do I hit? It's a real tough game once you start walking into that, into that arena. Uh, a second difficulty is, uh, are we for anti-corruption policies? Sure. Do we want aggressive efforts to attack corruption? Yes. Would we be better off if the corruption tax that we pay as citizens shrank? Sure. What happens when you stoke up a big anti-corruption program, partly fueled by the concern with bid rigging? What happens if you really turn up the volume on that system and get a much more powerful vehicle to go after it? There is the Frankenstein's monster problem. And the problem with the monster is, the monster starts going around the landscape and throwing the little girl into the pond. The monster starts reaching for everything. A very high-powered, high-octane, anti-corruption mechanism, either an inspector general or a prosecutor, starts saying, I'm gonna look at them all. I'm gonna find corruption everywhere. I think that all government agencies are suspect and I'm gonna overturn every rock to look at every one. I don't care who it is, I'm gonna go raid them, I'm gonna examine them. My mandate is to go after all of them because this is a sickness that pervades the entire field of public administration and I've got to go in there and bear down. And the state of mind of the prosecutorial authorities is I'm gonna scour every single element of public administration to go after them, Ukraine. Corruption in Ukraine, well, is there flour and bread? Yeah. In some ways, ubiquitous. It's a horrible, horrible legacy of the period of totalitarian control. All kinds of bad habits developed that became so routine that they were thought to almost be official and accepted. Because the way in which you got things done, you went through back doors, you crawled through the windows. The front door was locked. But you found ways to get done what you had to, and it often involved paying people to sell their office to get things done. A deep-seated culture of using payments as a way of getting in the fast track to get done what you, what you wanted to. Ukraine had a period initially with a successful launch of a competition system in the 1990s, then a terrible decline. But two years ago, new leadership, said, we're gonna revive this. Lots of support and encouragement from international organizations like the OECD, like UNCTAD. The European Union, uh, footnote on Europe, it's astonishing to see how much the gravitational pull of a deeper relationship with the European Union affects governments like this. You could look at Ukraine for a moment and say, hopeless. If you were in the emergency room doing the triage and they bring it in on a pallet, you could say, put that one over there. These will survive. They have a fighting chance, but give them a shot of morphine, but let them go. Not worth our effort. These we can save. You could have said that about Ukraine and say, let it go. It's too hard to fix it, too difficult. But you have a government with some will 
they've appointed a good board, they brought good people in. The odds against them are enormous, and if you were betting at the wagering house of your choice, you'd probably short the stock. You would short the possibility. It's just so hard to do. But there's an agency that's trying to do it. They've tried to make their own operations as clean as they possibly can, good procedures. That's one of the best safeguards you have as an agency. One thing we learned from this whole experience is that if you're going to take shots at these deeply entrenched arrangements, you have to be as clean as you possibly can. Good procedures, no irregularities, document the contacts with the outsiders who might be interested in what you're doing, as well as strong adherence to conflict of interest and other controls on the inside. That is, you don't want to give anyone an excuse to come after you. They will come after you anyway, but you don't want to make it easy for them. So the internal procedural safeguards, ethical commands, those are indispensable if you're going to play in this game because it is so rough and so difficult. And again, you're endangering income streams, reputations and power that people treasure, and they don't give it up very easily. So here we have the new agency. It's underway. There is a parallel anti-corruption campaign in Ukraine with a powerful prosecutor with a remit to do all sorts of things. The general prosecutor's office, the GPO, during the American Bar Association spring meeting of the antitrust section in Washington this past spring, many public officials are invited. Lots of you have been there in the bar or as public officials, you've been there, you participated in those programs. One of the attendees is Yuri Yevgenev, who's the chair of the Anti-Monopoly Commission of Ukraine. It's a really nice week for him. He's been on the podium. He's had a chance to do some really interesting things, build some goodwill, talk about his program. It's upbeat and positive. I'm standing with him in the lobby of the Marriott, people coming by saying hello, and buzz, buzz, buzz. Okay, out comes the device. What he has is a short text and a photo of people entering his building. He's being raided. Oh, they waited till he was long gone out of the country before they did this. Who's coming in the door? These are investigators with military fatigues carrying machine guns. Large numbers of them. Machine guns with no sense of humor. Imagine if you are a junior case handler or a manager, and I come up to Eduardo, and I don't have a pen or paper, but I'm standing there like this. <laughs> I would be unsettled by that. The agency responded well. What caused it? There was a tip that they had prosecuted a case and imposed a fine that was not strong enough. It involved tobacco, one of the biggest dominant enterprises in the country. They'd imposed the biggest fine that the AMCU had ever imposed, but the claim was they resolved the case this way as a concession to the dominant firm, and it had to be a corrupt bargain because they didn't impose a much bigger fine and greater sanctions. So for a couple of days, the guys with machine guns are running around the offices, give me your computer, or what? Very intimidating. Um, was that specifically a political hit on the AMCU? Maybe not. It is a public prosecutor who's lost any sense of proportion and is being told, it's all bad, it's all corrupt, nothing that happens is happening for a good reason, so if you get a tip, you have to dive in. In life, a lot depends on the dosage. If you have a headache, if you take two aspirin, it'll fix your headache. If you swallow the whole bottle, you're dead. And a difficulty in environments that have severe corruption problems historically is that the cure has been to take the whole bottle and to set in motion a process of prosecution and investigation that operates on a hair trigger basis. And any accusation is a basis to go in, not in a subtle way, saying, knock, knock, we're from the audit group, we're going to come in and do some work. I'm wearing a suit and a tie, 
I have a portfolio, I'm coming in quietly, can we have a room to work, I'd like to start talking to the managers. As opposed to walking in the door with machine guns. That is very unsettling for the agency. It also is affecting the way in which agencies in some countries are disposing of cases. Ukraine's another good example. Um, several of us who were there uh, for a follow-up of a peer review did. We spent a morning with the agency watching them deliberate on cases. The board, the plenum was meeting on cases, one after another, short presentation, then a resolution. There's always a problem with translation, simultaneous translation. It's, it's, it's such a hard job. The interpretation's difficult. And, and we wondered in listening here, because the interpreter was sitting with a group of us quietly in a corner trying to tell us what was going on. You think, God, am I picking this up right? But for the most part, our collective view was, these seem to be very mundane matters. These are the sorts of things that we, in settings we're familiar with, we would handle on the paper. You'd pass around a voting note to the board and say, yes, no, maybe, no, 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 done. These would take two minutes filling out a form, no, no, no. And we're wondering, why is the board spending a whole morning looking at this handful of obviously insignificant and patently misguided complaints, which they ultimately are dismissing? And we asked afterwards, why are you doing this? Answer, our junior managers are afraid to do it, and individual board members are afraid to do it because the suspicion will be, if you dismiss an open file, that was paid for. That was corrupt. So we, the whole board, collectively have to do this as a way of saying we mean it, we think it deserves to be dismissed. That's a wonderfully ineffective way to deal with the routine business. And in lots of agencies, that slows them all down because they have to go through a bulletproof procedure to put the imprimatur of the entire board behind a decision to dismiss a seemingly insignificant matter. It means that if you open a file, you're in for a long and difficult journey to dispose of the matter in question. And it meant that when the new team came in, they had files that were 5, 10, 15 years old. Why? Nobody felt comfortable in closing those files. So the docket of work became a set of extras for a zombie movie. They're all dead, but they're still there. And there they sit. And the resources devoted to dealing with the zombies are resources that cannot be devoted to your substantive program. This again is a residue of anti-corruption efforts unbounded as a solution to the perceived problem of corruption. This goes back to the problem of distrust. What happens if the infection takes place? The larger public will start to say the whole body's sick. And if that's the perception, you get the full bottle of aspirin, not a couple. Uh, the last difficulty is cooperation transactions costs, which has been a theme of discussion. Go back to our first plenary on, on, on Wednesday. In most instances, who's going to be involved as you start walking into the corruption area? Yes, it's the competition ag agency. If it's an administrative agency in the tradition of most civil administrative competition enforcement programs, you can't bring the criminal cases yourself. You're gonna to have to enlist the work of a public prosecutor, that's one. The public prosecutor, if it does involve corruption, will deal with the anti-corruption office as well, that's two. My experience in government is that just because you have public agencies operating in a similar domain, it does not mean they get along well with each other. This was part of my education going back to the FTC in 2001. We were preparing to do a study involving the IP system. And we met with the Patent and Trademark Office to start planning this and said, this is an opportunity for all of us to consider valuable reforms to the IP system. It's gonna make it all work better. Good for you, good for us, good for society, good for competition. You've never seen such a, collective, a collection of hostile stares. The silence. The silence that rebukes you. The silence that screams at you. They gave us all a cold cup of coffee. They pointed us to the parking garage and said, we're finished. But thanks for coming by and do be in touch. 
That relationship took a long time to develop, and the routine handling of cases involves stunning cooperation costs. Over time, there can be a learning curve, and those flatten out a bit, but that's over time. And there's nothing easy, simple, or quick about building the synapses that make this work. That's the cost of doing work in this area. Let me finish with a few suggested solutions, possible solutions. When you look at what uh, jurisdictions are doing broadly to facilitate prosecution involving bid rigging, a number of them have created tripwires that facilitate the prosecution of cases. And one of the most important is what is often called the Certificate of Independent Pricing Determination. What's that? I take a piece of paper. You're providing a tender. And I say, I want you to look at this and sign this for me. What does the top say? It says, simply put, I determine my price by myself and not with anybody else. I determine the terms on which I'm going to tender by myself and not by anybody else. This bid was prepared by me alone, not in consultation with anyone else. Translation, I didn't collude. I did it alone. The bottom says, the failure to truthfully provide this certificate is a criminal offense. It is lying to the government. It is a false statement. And if you knew at the time you signed this document, and by the way, who signs? High level government official, high level aid, uh, uh, company official, along with the person who prepared the bid, if this isn't right, it's a criminal offense. So when you do the prosecution, if you find the real cartel, you've got them right away with this piece of paper. You lied. You knew it was a collusive scheme, you lied. I don't have to talk about effects, I don't have to talk about any number of other subtle issues. I've got you right here. Indeed, in some ways, I don't even have to bring the cartel offense case, because I got you right here. Certificate of Independent Pricing Determination. Uh, and it does have the effect of causing procurement officials and companies to pause a moment before they sign that. Because the letter at the bottom, the language says, it's a crime if you're lying to us. But it's a pleasure doing business with you. Thank you for your interest in public procurement. Bounties. Um, some procurement systems will pay informants part of what the government recovers if it wins. Uh, in response to one of the many recurring procurement scandals we have in the United States, the Congress of the United States in, in the mid-1980s dramatically enhanced a much older mechanism to provide rewards to informants. It says this, if you give us information that helps us identify an illegal scheme to steal money from the government, we'll give you some, up to 35% of what we get. If you were deeply involved yourself, we will bring that down, but generally not to zero, to something like four, five, or 6%. What have been the biggest rewards so far? I think the largest uh, for an individual was 256 million US dollars for one informant. It was a fraudulent scheme involving the national health care plan for senior individuals, Medicare. It was a company that was submitting two invoices for every procedure that it performed. One procedure, two invoices. This person inside the company was in the accounting department and innocently went to a superior and said, as far as I can tell, we did this once, but we billed them twice. It's an error. Yes, it could be, but we've done it thousands of times. Uh, it's a computer problem. Yes, but all of our computers seem to be doing this. Don't worry about it. Well, he did. The mechanism provides that you can hire a lawyer who will represent you if you recover. The bad guys pay the lawyer's bills. The lawyer also will be able to guide you through the mechanism. There's an anti-retaliation mechanism, but the rewards are set high enough so that you will have a pension, basically. 
it anticipates that you're not going to be hired in this sector again. Hi, I'm leaving my employer. What was your main accomplishment then there? Oh, accomplishment with your previous employer. I, I turned them in. <laughs> uh, they paid a big fine and many of them are in jail, but I'd love to work for you. Uh, you will be radioactive. You won't have a chance to do this in the future. It's deliberately designed at a high level. The US government require, recovers billions of dollars every year through this mechanism involving the procurement system. Uh, there's, it's been used, it is applicable to bid rigging on government contracts. It's been used a few times there. But the notion of it is that someone who's inside who sees it will get a reward. Now, in a sense, leniency is a reward system, isn't it? You tell me, I give you a dispensation from punishment, sometimes a pretty sweeping dispensation. This is another form of payment. The mechanism in the US is called the Civil and Criminal False Claims Act. It's created a significant bar of people. They have meetings like this, to people who represent whistleblowers. And they discuss the science of representing whistleblowers in these kinds of, kinds of cases. Uh, one way to augment the existing mechanism is to tell people, we will pay you. In the words of the statute, we will pay a rogue to catch a rogue. And the payments are set pretty high. Better operations research. Um, this is what competition agencies could do more with the body of cartels they have and with past experience. It's striking to me how little effort public agencies do to provide an amalgam, a composite of all the cartels they're seeing. That is, what is the history of cartel enforcement that we have? How did it happen? Who did it? How did it take place? And to go to public procurement authorities and say, you should do the same thing. If you're noticing in recurring bidding episodes a consistent pattern in who wins, a consistent pattern of who gets subcontracts, that is not cosmic fate or mere chance. That's a deliberate scheme. How do we know? Well, some researchers have gone back and read all of the accounts of past cartels. Two researchers, uh, one at Penn State, one at Duke, Bob Marshall, Leslie Marks. The best book on collusion ever written in the modern era, 2012, The Economics of Collusion, MIT Press. Bob and Leslie did what lawyers won't do. They went back and read all of those decisions. They read them all especially the European Union decisions, European Commission decisions, which in the old days, before the shortcut settlement procedure, used to have rich, detailed statements of how the cartel worked. As great literature, these are terrible decisions. There are no jokes. There are no pictures. They're mind-numbingly bad, written in the commission speak of the commission. It was found in this instance that, oh God, passive voice again. A 40 word long sentence, spare me, God, don't do this. I will reform my life if I don't have to read these. It's why many people don't read them very often, but Bob and Leslie read every one. What do they extract from them? I wonder who teaches these guys to write, by the way. I'm afraid they're taken to a room and told, there's a little bit of humanity and clarity. If you wring that out of this, we'll let you work here. <laughs> but Bob and Leslie read them all. And what they did is they noticed there are certain recurring patterns in how cartels form and operate. And they extracted from it a very detailed and informative deconstruction of what cartels do. As I've told some of you, this looks a little bit like a book about how to make an atomic bomb. Uh, if I was setting up a cartel, I'd read this book very carefully. But it's mainly aimed for the enforcement officials. This is what to look for. And here are the data sets you want to maintain to look for patterns that will be very informative in looking at the next one. What I would also like to see as part of this, someday as part of settlement discussions with firms is, for compliance. If you want to build a compliance program that I will respect, when this happens, you are going to do an internal assessment that tells me why this happened. I'm partly shaped here by my experience years ago with a law firm working for a company then known as McDonnell Douglas. I worked on lots of their commercial avi aviation and military aviation programs. The commercial aviation work mainly involved representing Lloyds of London, which is the insurance carrier for McDonnell Douglas at the time. Airline crashes. What is the standard practice? There is a careful, detailed review to find out why it happened 
exactly what happened as a way of not letting it happen again. I'd like to see more of that in our field. I don't want you to just tell me, sorry, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. I'm really sorry about this. I wish it didn't happen. He said, I understand that, but how did it happen? How did the cartel start? Oh, rogue manager. What you see in these efforts to construct a detailed profile of cartels in chemicals, in auto parts, man, there must have been a lot of rogue managers running around. It wasn't a rogue manager. It was a deliberate decision taken at more senior levels of the company to do this. And I want you to tell me how that happened and what you're going to do to fix it so it doesn't happen the next time. I want accident reconstructions so that we avoid this accident in the future. And if you do that, I will respect your compliance program. If you can show me that that's happened and you share me that information, because that will be informative to me about what to look at in the future, but it will be your demonstration of sincerity that you want to fix this. And no, I don't want to hear about your videos, your little comic books for senior managers, how many lectures you've given to them. In the words of Amy Winehouse, no, no, no. I'm not interested in that. I want to know systematically and institutionally what you are doing to put inside safeguards, whether it's your board, whether it's what your head of legal services inside does. I want you to find out how this happened. And if you say rogue, I'm going to say go back to work. But if you do this, I'll respect your compliance program. And by the way, I think this is a way to get real compliance because you will know why you got sick and how it happened, and how incentives created at the top may have influenced people. Better operations research, deeper international cooperation, we've talked about that this week. You have, in many ways, individual hospitals, their competition systems around the world. One of my colleagues, David Hyman, explains to me, David's a, David's a medical doctor and he's a lawyer. He's a real doctor. And he says, in medicine, how did the state of the art in medicine improve over time? How did it get better? Pooling information. If you have a cardiology department in your hospital and you do heart surgery, you learn a lot. You study very carefully pre-operation diagnosis, surgical technique in the operating theater, and post-operative care. And you assemble that body of information, you see what works, how it worked, and you improved. Imagine what you can do if you take the experience base of one hospital and you join it up with others, and that's happened. So that you don't have a single hospital looking at its own data and experience, it's going down the learning curve looking at thousands of hospitals, looking at what was done over time. This kind of operations research could be done across agencies so that we know more broadly what's taking place because look at how many of the cartels are operating in lots of countries. And I wanna pose the same question to the business officials, why? How did this happen? And what are you going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And last, uh, international institutions do have a positive role to play here. This is not a complete cure by any means, but there is a power of peer review and international, international views and perspectives. In a benign way, in a helpful way, look how helpful it was in the, in the reform of the Brazilian law in this decade. But also in this instance, how it is possible in the course of building a program for international organizations to look at the competition agency and say this is worthwhile. To assist them in dealing with the backlash that sometimes takes place. And in particular for international organizations that give money, the international donor banks, to be a little bit more aggressive in looking at how their money's spent. Now, there's a problem if you're a major donor. Instead of just being a donor, you start to see yourself as, to look at the language, a partner. I'm a partner with the country. We are working together on this. What happens if your partnership involves manifestly corrupt projects? Your reaction might be outrage. You've wasted your money, you've tarnished my reputation. I'm going to bore in on this to make sure that you don't get a dime until this gets fixed. That's one way to look at it. The other way is, oh my God, I'm gonna get blamed for this too. This is my project, it's our project, we're endangered. 
And in a number of instances, the major donors drag their feet in really focusing in the way they might on some of these projects, including those that are financing them and ought to be absolutely determined to make sure the money's used well. In many instances, they have a habit of looking obliquely the other way. They have a lot of leverage. They have a lot of force. It could be used more effectively this way. So, car wash, really big deal. Huge deal. Big deal yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Astonishing case. Public procurement worth the scrutiny? No doubt about it, for all kinds of reasons. Maybe most of all, the trust that the public resides in government or takes away. Worth doing, yes. Can competition law make contributions? No doubt. Hard to do, extremely hard <laughs> to walk into this area because it is so fraught with political hazards, with corruption programs, well-minded that tend to be a little bit excessive in their tendency to scour everything instead of using a more nuanced approach. And an agency has to reflect upon this and contemplate this. And by the way, other agencies around the world, when they read about raids, it's sobering. I've talked to a number of officials who think about the anti-corruption programs in other countries, heads of agencies who say, I'm not interested in doing that right now. I'd rather pick other cases. I'd rather look someplace else. I, I just don't want that. Uh, I don't want the Frankenstein's monster coming to visit me. I'd rather see I'd rather look in another direction. There are other good things to do. I'll do those. I won't take this on. And of course, the difficulties in building good cooperative frameworks. The good cooperation, as we said already this week, takes a long time. That's a, that's a slow growth. That's a process of building, building trust and confidence across the agencies over time. Again, those connections tend to be difficult to build and they're fragile. But without them, you don't get the cooperation needed to make, make things work over time. And yes, there are the things we can add to the mix, maybe to make the program more effective. Uh, worth doing, hard to do, arguably as important as anything else is a, that a competition agency can do. And again, the program here, I'd say, as important as any case in the world today. Thank you. Muito obrigado, muito obrigado, professor. É, essa fala realmente é muito é, representativa para nós, que estamos atravessando um momento é, exatamente esse, de muito desafio e que exige muita cautela, tanto do nosso lado, dos advogados, quanto também dos servidores do CAD, mas, sem dúvida nenhuma, precisamos ter coragem para que isso não interfira negativamente no desempenho das funções do CAD, no diálogo frutífero que nós temos desenvolvido, tanto institucionalmente como também no contraditório dos casos concretos. Eu queria agora, então, passar para o nosso próximo painel, chamando os moderadores, a doutora Leonor Cordovil, o doutor Leonardo Rocha Silva e o doutor Guilherme Ribas. Bom dia, 
a gente já vai passar direto para o próximo painel, que é a mesa redonda. É, e, para isso, eu já queria, por favor, a chamar para compor a nossa mesa um, os palestrantes internacionais. Deixa eu ver. Professor? Stephen, Stephen, if you can just sit here beside, please. Bom, bom dia a todos novamente. É, eu gostaria de começar. Uh, esse painel uh, com um agradecimento uh, eu vou com um agradecimento é, o nosso seminário tem ficado cada vez mais internacional é, e uh, não só uh, isso é fruto de uh, da participação do IBRAC em vários eventos uh, em, em comunhão talvez com outro, outros institutos internacionais uh, mas também uma das grandes razões é podermos contar com uh, palestrantes internacionais e uh, uh, pessoas tão importantes no nosso meio uh, antitruste uh, no, nos nossos eventos por isso nós começamos com o nosso agradecimento pela presença de vocês aqui né que abrilhantam uh, e trazem a uh, os temas principais, as discussões uh, de outras jurisdições, para que nós todos podamos, possamos conhecer aqui no Brasil. É, a ideia nossa nesse painel uh, é uh, fazer perguntas, a ideia é ser um bate-papo uh, com, uh, 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 com os palestrantes e não termos um tema só, mas uh, o que nós imaginamos é poder uh, abordar diferentes aspectos e diversos uh, uh, temas, em especial relacionados aos currículos e à experiência de cada um dos que aqui uh, compõem o nosso painel. Uh, por essa razão, eu, o Ribas e o Léo uh, preparamos algumas perguntas uh, de acordo com os currículos e com a experiência desses, dessas, desses, desses palestrantes uh, e vamos endereçar uh, cada uma dessas perguntas. A nossa ideia é a gente vai, durante algum tempo, talvez uma hora, uh, endereçar essas perguntas e depois ó, a gente vai abrir para que vocês também possam fazer perguntas a cada um deles. Bom, eu vou começar, então, uh, com a minha primeira pergunta, é e relacionada a, a, a um pouco a experiência do TON uh, internacional uh, em uh, transações internacionais que são notificadas uh, muitas vezes em várias jurisdições. Né? A gente uh, tem ouvido uh, falar um pouco uh, sobre algum... Uma, alguma discussão sobre um eventual protecionismo europeu em relação uh, às uh, transações que são uh, notificadas uh, uh, na Europa envolvendo empresas europeias e também ouvindo a mesma coisa em relação a transações notificadas nos Estados Unidos em relação a empresas americanas. E a gente queria um pouco ouvir, a gente sabe que você tem muita experiência em notificação e uh, discussões uh, de transações notificadas em várias jurisdições e a gente queria um pouco ouvir se você concorda Uh, com essa ideia e qual a sua experiência. Well, uh, thank you, Leonor, for the question. I think, um, from a European perspective, I think I would disagree with the uh, with the contention that there is sort of some sort of protectionism has crept into the European Commission's review of uh, mergers. I think, in relation to merger control, I'm, I'm not sure whether there is sort of a debate. Uh, that um, U.S. companies or foreign companies uh, more general are being treated 
uh, more severely than uh, the European counterparts who file uh, their mergers uh, for review by the European Commission. I think um, uh, there are a number of, of sort of uh, hotly debated uh, mergers, uh, which I think have been discussed in the context of the conference as well. For example, Dow Dupont, those, that's a case which involved exclusively American companies, but I don't think that the nationality of the companies as such had any impact on the way in which the Commission uh, reviewed uh, that case. I think uh, that case was, was about sort of the innovation theory of harm, uh, which is sort of a, a theory which the Commission has been has been focusing on for a number of years, uh, but again, I don't think that the nationality of the companies as such had any impact or influence on, on the way in which the, the the Commission looked at that case. And I would actually turn it around in the sense that, sort of having acted for a number of uh, European companies in the context uh, of uh, merger control cases, it, it it is very difficult to bring an argument to the Commission. Uh, on the basis uh, of sort of creating a European champion. Yeah, I think uh, a, a, a number of private practitioners in Europe would probably uh, think that there is, 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 is some room for improvement at that level, that the Commission takes into account some sort of uh, broader industrial policy arguments uh, in, its, in its review of mergers in order for European companies to become more, more competitive on, on, on the global field. So, you know, in relation to merger control, my short answer is no, I don't think that there is any problem of, of protectionism in Europe. Posso só completar a minha pergunta, é, se você pudesse falar, antes de perguntar, passar para o Léo, uh, em relação a condutas, a sua opinião é a mesma? Well, in relation to conduct cases, I, I, think, um, I think I am of the same opinion. Um, there are probably sort of a number of uh, aspects to, 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 to that view. I think in, in relation to cartels, I'm not quite sure that there are any statistics out there which uh, suggest that American companies have been treated more severely than, than European companies. I think I was involved in a study about two years ago, sort of looking at the nationality of, of, of the, the, the prime targets of European Commission cartel investigations, and I think what came out of that uh, that sort of uh, statistical analysis is, is that it is actually Asian companies who have been the prime target of, of, of cartel investigations, not only in Europe, but also in the US. Um, so I'm not seeing any sort of level of protectionism at, 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 at the level of cartel enforcement. I think unilateral behavior, uh, that, that others may have different views, but I, I think, again, the, the cases which we are uh, seeing uh, at the European level, the, the cases like Intel, Google are obviously cases which, uh, which are very high profile and being hotly debated in the antitrust uh, arena, but um, I think as Professor Wish already indicated uh, the day before yesterday, if you look back at the track record of the European Commission, uh, in terms of uh, enforcement unilateral behavior, the vast, vast majority of the cases have been uh, targeted at sort of breaking up uh, monopolies uh, in the European member states. And, and, and I don't see any, any reason uh, to, to argue that there is, that there is protectionism from, from the Commission side. So I think maybe one final, final remark, uh, and that sort of completes the picture. Uh, I think a number of those comments about protectionism have also been made in the area of state aid in Europe, which is sort of a, a, a fundamentally European part of, 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 of competition law. Uh, the Commission has been investigating a number of member states uh, recently for granting selective uh, tax benefits to uh, a number of multinationals. Uh, again, very high profile cases which have been uh, reported on widely in the, in the mainstream press. Uh, cases involving companies like McDonald's, like Amazon, uh, Apple, Starbucks. Um, again, I do not see any, uh, any sort of um, link between the nationality of the companies involved in those cases and the way in which the Commission analyzed the behavior of the member states, because those are investigations against member states and not individual companies. I think had those companies been European companies, the outcome would have been exactly the same. And I think the practice also shows that there were a number of those cases which were targeted against uh, member states having granted selected tax benefits to European companies. So I, I just don't see, I don't see any protectionism in, in, European, uh, in European competition law. 
Obrigada. Uh, só fazendo duas observações que eu esqueci aqui. Uh, no início, o meu chefe à esquerda está me pedindo para avisar que o check-out do hotel é até duas horas. Então, todo mundo pode esperar. Tá? É, segundo lugar, a Fiona uh, vai fazer interrupções e Fiona é, sinta-se livre para uh, fazer comentários a qualquer uma das perguntas. Léo? É, eu tenho uma pergunta para o Paul. A gente sabe que o Paul tem uma grande experiência nas ações privadas por, de indenização por cartel. E a gente está nesse momento aí de definir a resolução do CAD. Queria algumas sugestões do, do Paul em relação a como estabelecer o um equilíbrio adequado entre a proteção dos dados que são apresentados às autoridades é, e, inclusive, a proteção do próprio programa de leniência e o adequado incentivo às ações de reparação de danos. Como é, o Paul poderia nos ajudar a com informações e com a sua experiência é, para estabelecermos esse equilíbrio adequado. Thank you very much. Um, so starting on the the question of leniency statements, I think the first comment I would make, and this is a general comment, is that these tasks of looking at evidence and seeing what should be produced are tasks which are perhaps best carried out by the courts, who are used to dealing with uh, evidentiary issues. Uh, confessions in criminal processes, I believe, are, are not so strange to be produced in civil proceedings. So it's a bit of a particularity of the competition field that uh, we have so much concern with what the courts are going to do, but there may be good reasons for that. Um, but as a first answer, I would say that the right balance can be struck by the courts themselves. That was indeed uh, the, um, the position that was adopted in the European Union originally by the European Court of Justice in the uh, case of Flydera. Uh, and that was then um, uh, employed, that criteria, which was essentially to the, 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 the judge in, in the case, the civil case, should strike the balance uh, between what was really necessary for the civil proceedings uh, to protect the right to claim damages, and at the same time protecting uh, the, the public policy goal of in, um, incentivizing uh, leniency, and therefore protecting public enforcement. And we have a, a good example of the, of the balance being executed, let's say, by uh, uh, Peter Roth, uh, the uh, judge of the uh, Competition Appeal Tribunal in London in the case of National Grid. Um, and uh, that was an interesting exercise. It has to be said that there aren't very many judges uh, as good as Peter Roth, and there aren't very many places where you can spend quite so much time over it. And it was a very, very... Uh, time-intensive exercise. So one can then appreciate why, uh, perhaps in a rather paternalistic way, uh, the European Union then legislated the question and said, no, uh, we're going to decide this. Uh, lenient sta leniency statements can't be produced, nor can settlement sub submissions. So the decision was taken out of the hands of the judge. There's still proportionality with regard to other issues. Um, I would then add that as a practitioner looking at these cases, leniency statements I don't think are so important as perhaps you might, might think. The key for um, anyone looking to bring a claim is the decision, uh, and then depending on the disclosure regimes that are, operate, the pre-existing documents, uh, and those will be subject to normal disclosure rules. Um, confidentiality, of course, is something that's carried out uh, within the proceeding of the administration, um, and it's a useful first exercise, let's say, but I would also add again that the court will have its own criteria for deciding what should be protected as confidential in a civil proceeding. Uh, worth noting on decisions, that for me is the key, and the question is how much information do you put in the decision? Uh, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, Bill mentioned this in his intervention, in some of the older commission decisions, uh, there was a lot of detail, and some of that is extremely useful and interesting. Uh, for uh, people looking to bring uh, claims. One of the problems of having such detailed decisions is that it can take enormously long to actually publish them because of all the fights about confidentiality. And Air Cargo is a good case in point uh, where there's years uh, trying to get the final judgment uh, decision published. And that's one of the reasons maybe that shorter decisions end up being published and that there can be a balance to be struck there. Final point on incentivizing. Again, I under, underline the importance. This is, this is not... Uh, a practice that's carried out in the administrations. It's a practice that is carried out and enforced by the courts. The courts are the ones that have to deal with all these issues. The key is having good courts. 
Uh, I know that there's a decision being adopted, I think, in Brazil to create a competition court, which uh, I believe could deal not only with administrative cases, but civil, uh, specialized court. That, for me, is, would be the, is the key incentivizing tool, is to try to get good courts that can manage these cases. Obrigado. Ribas? Uma pergunta para o professor Wish. Na sua apresentação na última quarta-feira, o senhor nos trouxe análise sobre o caso Intel e a jurisprudência de descontos na União Europeia. E foi muito interessante ouvir como a interação entre as cortes europeias e a Comissão Europeia foi enriquecedora para esse debate, para a construção da jurisprudência. O senhor também é, trouxe, é, explicou as diferenças dos sistemas é, jurídicos é, na Europa e nos Estados Unidos e das instituições é, nessas regiões que podem explicar as diferenças é, de resultados em casos como Intel é, e Microsoft. Então, a nossa pergunta é num, num tema, num hot topic para os ingleses, é, como fica uh, 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 o Reino Unido após uh, a saída da União Europeia, uh, 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 as cortes inglesas terão o mesmo nível de interação com a uh, Competition uh, uh, and Markets Authority na, na Inglaterra e a gente pode esperar uma mudança da Inglaterra pro, mais semelhante ao modelo uh, americano, tendo em vista que os dois são uh, países de common law. Well, I can't say what's going to happen after Brexit because it's obvious that our government doesn't know what's going to happen after Brexit. Um, it's getting very close. It's about 16 months away. Uh, and the government hasn't even begun to uh, disclose what the future shape of uh, things might be. Uh, Brexit has enormous implications for the United Kingdom, but I don't think it has that many implications specifically for competition law. And I'll explain why. Um, after the referendum, a small group of us um, came together and established the Brexit Competition Law Working Group, uh, seven of us. And we submitted proposals to government in July of this year, and they're available on the web. And we looked very carefully at what Brexit would mean for the domestic competition law of the United Kingdom. And broadly speaking, um, I don't think there's a problem, actually. And the reason for that is that we have a domestic form of Articles 101 and 102. We've got a very well-established merger control system. When we leave the EU, the domestic law is all in place. So there's no immediate amendment that's needed, there's no gap. Um, so from that point of view, it's quite a seamless process. Obviously, there are formidable issues over transitional matters. What about a merger that has been notified to the European Commission pre-Brexit, where the decision is going to be post-Brexit? So there are technical transitional issues of that uh, nature. Um, it'll also be important to put in place international cooperation mechanisms, because at the moment, of course, the United Kingdom is part of the European Competition Network. The Competition and Markets Authority works very closely with DG Comp in Brussels, with the Bundeskartellamt in Germany, and so on and so forth. But all the machinery that enables that cooperation to take place to get, uh, today will go. So it'll be very important to put something in its place. I think you're asking a broader question. Might UK law diverge from EU law over time? And if it diverges away from EU law, will it converge towards the American system? Well, I don't see that myself. Um, the words of our legislation are the same as the words of Articles 101 and 102. And you know, a cartel is a cartel is a cartel. Um, and there's no reason, I think, for the United Kingdom to establish different standards uh, for controlling cartel behavior. Um, conceivably, the UK might want to diverge from some aspects of EU policy 
in particular, as many of the people in the audience will know, one of the overarching goals of EU competition law is to create a single market. Well, after Brexit, we will be outside that single market. So whether that single market imperative will continue to influence our domestic law, I just simply do not know. Um, I've already spoken about uh, you know, EU, US. I think a lot of the discussion around that uh, topic is oversimplistic. I don't see any inevitability about our converging on US law. What I would say is post-Brexit, we will have the ability, if we so wish, to develop our own competition policy, taking into account international practice. Bom, a minha próxima pergunta para o Michael, uh, a gente viu que no seu, no, pelo, pelo seu currículo que você tem bastante experiência em casos de sham litigation. E esse é um tema que nós importamos é, dos Estados Unidos uh, e que para nós ainda é um tema uh, frequente na jurisprudência, nas discussões, é, mas a gente não tem visto muito as decisões, não mais, nos Estados Unidos, o que nos dá um pouco a impressão de que um, talvez seja um tema já antigo uh, 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 nos Estados Unidos. É, a gente queria saber se você concorda com essa opinião e qual é a sua experiência em relação a esse tema de sham litigation. Uh, thank you. Um, so I would say you're correct that sham litigation is not at the tip of every U.S. Uh, antitrust lawyer's tongue, um, and the jurisprudence is not uh, is not rapidly evolving. We kind of have um, the, the standards, which are not exactly uniform across the various circuit courts. So uh, it is somewhat static uh, at this point, and we have other issues um, that that dominate, um, you know, our litigation dockets, such as you know foreign commerce issues. What, uh, what what commerce counts under the Sherman Act, and that's where we spend a lot of our time litigating. Um, the way I think of of sham litigation is typically you're going to see that in uh, the context of uh, someone brings a patent infringement claim, and Uh, if you're um, the defendant in that patent infringement situation, you have a variety of tools in your toolbox to fight back uh, at, the, at the patentee who's, uh, who's uh, suing you. One of those is a sham infringement claim. Um, you can uh, also uh, assert claims of, you know, a, a Walker process claim of uh, fraud on the patent office. But I think one of the reasons why uh, we hear a little bit less about uh, sham litigation, the, the essence of that being really, as a defendant, you're saying, I, I think that the suit you brought is objectively baseless, and the reason you brought this was to try and interfere with my business. Um, a much more effective um, and recently developed tool for a defendant in a patent infringement case is uh, the inter partes review process, the IPR process, which now is a, is a very uh, quick and efficient way to get in front of the, uh, the, the patent board in the United States to have them take a very quick uh, look at the patent and if, if it really is a bunk patent, if it really is based on prior art, if it's, if it's no good, that's really the most efficient vehicle um, to, to strike back at someone who you think is bringing a baseless um, patent infringement case against you. So I, I, I think that's one of the main reasons why you haven't heard so much about sham litigation is this, this IPR process. Obrigado, Mike. Mais uma questão para o professor Bill. A gente viu essa excelente exposição do professor Bill agora pela manhã. E a gente vê também pelos artigos que ele publicou recentemente é, um olhar muito cuidadoso sobre a atuação de várias autoridades da concorrência e uma a, sugestão, talvez, de um foco maior dessas autoridades em buscar menos os casos chamados high profiles, mas muito de construir uma infraestrutura necessária para que a autoridade tenha condição a, de cuidar dos casos Uh, mais relevantes. Então, eu queria aproveitar um pouco da experiência uh, do professor Bill para dividir conosco o que, de fato, nesse momento, ele entende como infraestrutura necessária que uma autoridade como o CAD, por exemplo, precisa uh, ter para enfrentar um momento difícil como esse que nós vivemos. Obrigado. 
one of the uh, hardest issues is to deal with the relationships with other institutions that have figured so prominently in the, the discussion this week. Uh, whether it's the central bank in dealing with merger control or other forms of uh, competition-related behavior, whether it's the relationship with the uh, public prosecutor, anti-corruption authorities, whose work, of course, is deeply involved in the exercise of the cartel enforcement mandate. Uh, all of these relationships can be seen as the equivalent of building bridges uh, and establishing a mechanism for traveling across them on a regular basis. These are infrastructure inv investments in, in institutional arrangements. Uh, they don't have immediate payoffs. They tend to be long-term capital outlays. But uh, without them, you can't make the uh, exercise of concurrent shared parallel authority effective. So I would say, and I think, I think Kajay understands this with great clarity, it's why you have the formation of the working group with the central bank. It's why you have the ongoing efforts uh, to develop uh, uh, a better understanding with, uh, with prosecutors, uh, among other topics, on the, on the significance of, of individual unilateral uncoordinated decision making on the operation of leniency and other mechanisms. So one continued investment that I think the community would applaud is, is, is a dedicated effort to continue to invest in building these relationships really at three levels. It starts with a top level commitment by, an, by agency leadership and on Monday in Brasilia in the uh, program at the Central Bank, we saw the president of the Central Bank and the president of CAJ dedicate themselves once again in a very public way to this kind of collaboration. That sends a powerful constructive signal to the rest of the institution. But the same form of collaboration has to take place at the level of senior management, uh, uh, project management level, and at the level of case handlers. So uh, a continued dedicated effort to, to make this investment in building relationships, I think, is, uh, is, is, is a wise path. Uh, a dilemma is that it, it doesn't show up on the scoreboard in any visible way. Uh, that is, how are agencies measured? That would be fines, cases, fines, 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 cases, cases. Uh, if, you, if you give a talk to an audience, uh, I found when I was in an agency and saying, this is what we're going to do, uh, the audience looks through the program to see if there's a parallel session they can attend. Uh, and they turn back to those little evil devices and start looking at them. Uh, once you talk about institution building, uh, you've lost them right away. Yet. If you think of the areas of relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the banking institutions, the development of the ever more effective cartel enforcement program, the application of, civil, of criminal authority, uh, I don't see how that can happen if the bar in the larger community does not applaud that continued investment. The other, the, the, the other, another that comes to mind is uh, the, the ever important question of human capital at the agencies. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you ask what's a good agency, I'd say, tell me who's playing. Let me look at the team. Don't tell me the total number of employees. Tell me the total number of good employees, really good ones. Uh, that's the headcount I want to know. Uh, you know, Brazil's had a lot, of, uh, a lot of success in drawing good people in. But I, I'm struck at how many of the junior people I see uh, in law firms uh, who would like to have an opportunity to have that experience um, would not readily have a path to do that. Uh, I'm a fan of the revolving door. I realize it's, a, again, a matter of dosage. It can spin too fast. But I think, that, I think it would be enriching for KJ and for the bar if there were more opportunities for junior people to go into the agencies for a while. I couldn't imagine have, uh, had a, had a, having a senior position in a competition agency if I'd not worked in a law firm as well. I just, I just uh, not a day goes by when I didn't draw on something. So, so a program uh, that could consciously uh, have that circulation of people into the agency, out of the agency. In, in some countries, it's done with a conscious uh, view that it's almost like a secondment. You're going to go work there for two years. You're going to work for three years. You're going to come back. Uh, but I, I think there's a, a, an enormous value in the education that takes place, both for the bar that is, the agency isn't crazy. And for the agency, the companies aren't always devils. Uh, the, 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 uh, the tempering benefit that comes from that relationship, if there are a way to add that to the mix of building human capital, I'd do that too. 
Bill, I completely second that. And uh, my experience coming from Europe, where the European Commission was pretty much impenetrable to private practitioners and, and largely still is, I think is, is one of the areas where Europe could actually uh, benefit from a revolving door as well. I remember sessions with case handlers where they would accuse our clients of all sorts of uh, nefarious schemes that they didn't want to disclose to us because they didn't want to educate us on how nefarious we could be. And I thought, look, a couple of days in a company or a law firm might actually teach you that what many of us are just trying to make a living here and uh, we're not sitting there dreaming up plots to, uh, to uh, cartelize or uh, otherwise destroy Europe. <coughs> Uh, the other thing I, that occurred to me as I'm sitting here on this panel is, is the role of the courts in institution building. And again, coming from practice in Europe where we were largely in a model of judge, jury and an ex executioner for most of my time there. That was a very different world from then traveling across the pond to the US where I realized that every aspect of our practice was uh, it, was subject to the rigor of a court. And the agencies know that as well. And, and every aspect of their investigation is also subject to the overriding discipline of a court. Not, not employed in most cases, but nevertheless there as a constraint. So I'm very excited to hear about the uh, proposal to form a specialist competition tribunal, a court in Brazil, because I, I have seen that be a very effective method for helping agencies evolve to a higher level. Let, let's just look at the Intel case as an example in Europe and earlier cases where the CFI knocked the European Commission down for failing to adequately examine the evidence and prove its case. Uh, I'm, I'm all for courts having a role in, in the development of our institutions, the competition agencies. Obrigado. É, agora uma pergunta ao Stephen. É, falamos bastante aqui sobre diferenças no, nos Estados Unidos e na Europa, é, e, e a gente não poderia deixar de fazer uma pergunta para você, que trabalhou por muitos anos é, para o Google. É, esse ano tivemos a, a, a decisão do Google Search na Europa, de condenação, em contraste é, ao arquivamento nos Estados Unidos. É, o que você pode falar a respeito disso? Um, thank you very much. So, I think um, the question of why the case went so differently in the US and Europe is a, is a really interesting question, and I don't think anyone knows the answer. Um, I mean, on the one hand, we have the FTC, which looked at this and came to the view that Google's conduct was um, essentially good for, for, cons for consumers. And on the other hand, we have the European Commission, who came to the view that um, uh, there was an antitrust abuse, and they fined Google with the biggest antitrust fine in history, 2.4 billion euros. Um, so, uh, as I say, I don't think anyone knows the answer, but I think it's I think it's useful to consider four sort of possibilities of what's of what might be driving these differences. I think possibility one is that there's some kind of difference in doctrine between the U.S. and Europe. That's possibility one. Possibility two is that the facts of the case are different. Mm -hmm. Possibility three is um, that one of them has made a sort of substantive error. So either the European Commission has made a type one error or the FTC has made a type two error. And possibility four is that there's um, political factors involved. And these are the kind of four possibilities. So kind of going through these, I think the first one on is there a difference in doctrine? And obviously the FTC uh, when they made their statement, they, they, they made a um, very clear statement that competition law is, the purpose of it is to protect an effective competitive process, not to protect individual competitors. But I think the European Commission thinks exactly the same thing in practice. I don't think you can point to any sort of high-level high ideological difference as a, as a reason for a, a divergence here. Second point is the um, facts of the case. Now, obviously, there are, there's always going to be differences in the facts of the case. Um, one one um, issue to consider is that Bing is, uh, has got a stronger position in the US than it, than it does in Europe. But having said this, I really I, I struggle to see how different facts of the case could give rise to um, this, this, this divergence. Um, the conduct is essentially uh, the, the same across, across in both um, jurisdictions. 
Um, so uh, possibility three is that one of them has made a substantive error. Now, obviously, I'm an advisor to Google, so I obviously think that the European Commission has made a substantive error. Um, obviously, Google has appealed, so we'll get to find out in a few years whether the court thinks that the um, Commission has made a substantive error. So I don't think there's anything more we need, I need to say about that for the moment. And the fourth factor I said was, was um, we, maybe we need to understand something to do with, with politics around this case. And I think I'll make a few observations here. The first is that I do not think there's a anti-US bias. I think a few people have said that. Um, I don't see any evidence of an anti-US bias. So I, I, don't, I don't think, when I talk about politics, I don't mean sort of international politics. Um, another observation um, I'd make is that regardless of whether you think that the European Commission case team is influenced by politics, I think it's very clear that there is po politics around this case. Um, you know, if you think that during this case, the European Parliament discussed um, breaking up Google. Um, and then just this week, there's been a draft report in the European, um, uh, draft parliamentary report saying that um, the remedy doesn't go far enough, right? So I don't know whether the person who drafted that report has read the decision and fully appreciated all the nuances of the competition problem that um, needs to be fixed here, but that's you know, an interesting, very quick reaction from the court, say the remedy doesn't go far enough. Um, and then I think another observation I'd make is that the case is, you know, is, is un, it's unusual, right? So the, the commission went down a commitment um, path. They thought they could resolve this without a fine um, and just by saying Google needs to change its, change its conduct. Um, Commissioner Almunia wrote rejection letters to the complainants in this case and in, said very publicly, I don't see how I can, uh, that I will change my, change my mind about this. I, I, as far as he was concerned, the, the commitments solved the problem that he'd identified. But then, of course, he did change his mind. Um, and there have been some observers who have pointed to um, a change in the president of, of the European Commission around, uh, around that time. And obviously, I'm, I'm not going to make any, any um, further comments about that. But um, I, I, so from my perspective, it, it's now you know, just looking forward to when this is going to be heard in, in court, and then we'll get to see what the, the court thinks. Bom, é... Obrigada. A gente agora queria checar se tem alguma pergunta. Bruno. Bom dia, bom dia a todos. Eu queria endereçar a pergunta inicialmente para o Paul e para o Michael, mas, obviamente, abrir para quem quiser comentar em cima disso também. Eu acho que nós estamos aqui no Brasil agora, o Léo mencionou no momento, que alguns da nossa, da nossa comunidade concorrencial. Alguns já perceberam isso, eu acho que outros ainda não. Mas eu acho que nós estamos à margem da terceira revolução do antitruste aqui no Brasil. Pode parecer até muito forte essa essa afirmação, mas eu gostaria de entender de vocês, quer dizer, olhando de fora, conhecendo da forma que conhecem o país, como é que vocês veem, quer dizer, uma bem implementada um bem implementado o sistema de private enforcement, de ação de reparação aqui no Brasil, como é que isso pode mudar o, o sistema concorrencial brasileiro? Como é que isso pode impactar na questão do, uh, do, do, do enforcement? Uh, Para dar dois exemplos, quer dizer, o private enforcement pode liberar uh, recursos de uma autoridade que tem pouco recursos para, inclusive, ir atrás de uh, conduto unilateral. Uh, o private enforcement ele pode fazer com que haja mais compliance, quer dizer, para você apontar o dedo, você tem que olhar se você não tem telhado de vidro também, você tem que fazer o seu dever de casa. Como é que, então, como é que isso impacta? Como é que essa revolução pode impactar o sistema concorrencial brasileiro, a comunidade uh, concorrencial brasileira, por sua vez? E, e só um ponto adicional a isso. Uh, é a questão, vocês veem que... Uh, necessariamente tem que haver uma bipolarização, quer dizer, como acontece, acho que muito mais nos Estados Unidos do que na Europa. Você tem escritórios especializados em autores, você tem escritórios especializados na defesa das empresas. Ou pode ser algo que é, que é muito mais difuso, pelo menos nesse primeiro momento. Obrigado. Uh, Essa é uma pergunta ótima. 
from the American perspective, I would say uh, to, to one of your first points, uh, absolutely the presence of effective private civil enforcement can do wonders to free up resources for government agencies to focus on criminal actions, for one, in the US, um, and also to, to focus on their particular priorities. If there are particular industries, if there are particular types of offenses that um, the agencies want to spend their time on, then having um, the, the private enforcement as a backstop uh, is, is a huge thing to be able to rely on. Um, as you're uh, you know, undertaking this third revolution, um, you know, there's probably some lessons to be taken from the U.S. system in do you really want to go the full litigation route that is the American uh, judicial system. Um, I mean, it, it is fabulous for uh, antitrust enforcement, for uh, antitrust deterrence. Um, probably estimates are 80, 90, 90% 90 of, of, of actual enforcement of the antitrust laws is done privately. So, uh, and, it, and it's done with the, the threat of treble damages, of, of real deterrent uh, teeth. But, um, you know, there's probably, just from a, a, an outsider's perspective, there's probably a little bit of a middle ground to not go the full route of, 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 of the U.S. Uh, court system where claimants are so incentivized uh, to, to bring claims, um, to be able to recover attorney's fees, to seek joint and several liability, to be able to get, uh, to be able to get trouble damages. Um, on, on the point about, um, you know, is, is there, uh, does there have to be polarity of, of firms representing either plaintiff side or defendant side? I, I think in the U.S. where that line is most strongly drawn, and it's really, it's, it's really a Rubicon that you, that you cannot cross, is with respect to class actions. You, you really can't be a, a, a plaintiff's class action lawyer and then turn around and be a defense class action lawyer. You really have to pick a side on that because you are routinely arguing as to how, um, how the class action device should be interpreted, what standards should be applied. Um, in the U.S., there are certainly firms that represent both, um, both claimants and defendants as long as it's not in a class action context. So. Um, as long as you're not moving immediately towards a class action world, I think there's there's definitely room to have uh, specialized firms that can be on either side of, of civil enforcement. Thank you. I think the perspective from Europe is somewhat different. Um, on your first question, does it release resources for the competition authorities? I think the answer is definitely, for the moment, no. Um, why is that? Uh, well, I think perhaps because the civil system of damages doesn't have uh, the same teeth that the US system has. So you don't have broad disclosure in most places, you don't have treble damages, and you don't have, uh, although there's the beginnings of it in the UK now, you don't have class actions. So it means that um, compensation claims are, or, or damages claims are more for compensation by corporate entities normally. Um, so I don't think it's, uh, uh, so there aren't many standalone cases, for example. They're all follow-on cases. So if anything, the work of the competition authorities may be somewhat more because they're having to prepare files more carefully for the, considering the private enforcement side of things. Um, what has released resources in the EU has been the decentralization from the Commission to the national competition authorities and their ability to apply European competition law. and. Um, the, the, the provisions of Regulation 1, 2003. Uh, on your second question, um, th how does it affect the, the, the antitrust community? Well, I think it changes a little bit the, the um, profile in some ways because litigators begin to become involved. Um, you see new lawyers getting involved in the field. You see the need for collaboration from an early period, uh, an early moment between competition lawyers and litigators. So already during the public investigation, preparing for what was going to come in, in the future, and that would be influencing decisions, for example, on len leniency, et cetera. Um, and you see no new law firms uh, appearing on the, on the horizon. Uh, and on your last question about bipolarity, uh, well, 
I think it's um, you don't, the, the reality in Europe is you don't have such a dichotomy, um, except in some of the major law firms who are involved in so many of the uh, high-profile cases that uh, it makes sense for them to choose to be on one side or the other. Uh, if not, one would tend to uh, apply normal conflict rules uh, and normal business, let's say, of your, of your litigation department. So, for example, in Cuatro Casas, um, we've been involved on the, on the claimant side, particularly, and this is one of the, perhaps, differences with here, particularly on the European cases, so the, the UUI cases where we haven't been involved in the investigation, but we get involved in the, in the private litigation. Uh, whereas in Spain, normally we are on the defendant side because we tend to be involved in the investigations in, in Spain. I just wonder if I might make one comment. One comment in response to Bruno, and that's to make a distinction between cartel cases and abuse of dominance cases. A lot of the private enforcement, obviously, is where the commission has established a trucks cartel or a refrigeration compressor cartel, and then people come in after the event with the benefit of the commission's decision, and they sue for damages. Um, nobody is going to go to court to try to prove that there's a trucks cartel. It's inconceivable. You need a public authority, dawn raids, years of investigation, etc. But I think abuse of dominance is quite different because very often it's one player in a market with a highly focused complaint against Domco. There's no particular asymmetry of knowledge. We know what market we're in. I know how powerful you are, etc. My complaint is a specific refusal to deal or predatory pricing, etc. So um, that's much richer ground for private litigation because you go to a competition authority with its prioritization principles, it can only do so many cases at a, at a time. Something that's incredibly important to me and my business may not be that important to a competition authority. Um, but if there is the possibility of bringing a standalone action in a court, then that might be the best answer. And I say this specifically because in the United Kingdom, with effect from October of 2015, our Competition Appeal Tribunal can now hear standalone actions. And there have been several examples already where a complainant has gone to the cat, claimed abuse of dominance, and then we find within six months a settlement has been achieved and the case has gone away. Now, that seems to me in resource terms to be hugely important from the CMA's point of view because something that they might in an ideal world want to have investigated, they can't. And then there's a court with a door open, a fast-track procedure, all sorts of rules on capping recoverable costs, etc. And it is already proving to be a very, very useful resource. I just want to comment on that. As you think about developing your private enforcement regime, there are obviously some key questions that are going to affect how much you're going to be litigating and, you know, what the incentives are. Will you have treble damages? Will you have double damages? Will you only have single damages? Will the loser have to pay? That is a critical difference between the US and Europe. And the class action mechanism is the other. We, we call it the triumvirate in the US, you know, of nasties. The class action mechanism, treble damages, and the loser doesn't pay. That's fertile ground for private plaintiffs, wherever the cartel occurs or the anti-competitive act occurs, to try to bring that case in the US. The extent to which you'll be able to, or interested in doing the same here in, in uh, Brazil, I think will depend on the answers to those questions. You also asked about compliance. What impact does private litigation have on compliance? I can tell you that every time I go to clients with compliance training, the standard mantra is, and I'm not alone in this, that the government investigation is just the start. The real pain comes in the private action, which often results in you know, billions of dollars more than the, uh, the, the, the fine or penalty that you'll be paying to the government. And that is a huge disincentive uh, for companies. It, it literally could break the company. So I think you'll find that to be effective as well. Uh, you know, one, one note there is that um, 
One of, one of the clients I've represented for a while is a performing rights organization in the US. And their conduct throughout the ages has been defined and constrained as much by private litigation, much of it brought when the government declined to act, than, uh, than by the DOJ. Um, so, you know, that could be a ripe model, uh, as Richard suggests, for Brazil, in a, certainly in abuse of dominance cases. Carolina, temos uma pergunta aqui. Leonor, só um minuto. So, so just one very quick point, um, because it hasn't been mentioned yet, but it's an absolute driver uh, in the European Union, and that's funding. Uh, what we've also seen in, in private, private enforcement has brought in this whole uh, reali new reality of funding. So this is uh, law firms who are working on contingency fees. Uh, it's insurance companies insuring against the risk of adverse costs, uh, which can be very important in certain jurisdictions. Uh, it can be f uh, funds who are raising money to invest in litigation. Um, and this is a key reality to take, to take into account, and it's driving a lot of what you see in Europe. So what approach, if any, should be taken is something that has to be considered. N broadly in Europe, it's, uh, it's deregulated, or in some c countries it's prohibited, but um, it's, it's a big issue. Obrigado. Bom, a minha pergunta vai direcionada ao professor Kovacic, mas qualquer das pessoas que queiram responder, acho que vai completar bastante. É, na ideia de, de casos de cartel e corrupção, é, no desenho institucional, acho que na, no primeiro painel foi falado bastante que a gente tem algumas autoridades que lidam com, com colaboração, leniência, e eu queria saber qual é a sua opinião sobre desenho institucional, se é mais interessante a gente ter um guichê único para receber tipo de colaboração nesses casos que envolvem tantos assuntos, ou se a concorrência entre as autoridades faz algum sentido para você ter incentivos a mais acordos ou até, até mais informações de diferentes é, pessoas que queiram colaborar. I would say that we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, we might have a better answer to that in about 10 years. Uh, I say that because uh, the interesting policy developments have really begun to take root since, I would say, the early 2000s, where you see uh, the more robust test of, of different institutional models. There are about 130 jurisdictions now that have laws. Um, I'd say maybe a third of those can really bite you if you don't pay attention to them. A third of them are never got off the flat line. There's some in the middle trying to work. As bewildering as it is to individual counselors who have to advise companies in dealing with this extraordinary mosaic, uh, for researchers, there's an increasing basis for trying to answer your question, which is, which framework works best? And we do see across the institutions that are operating, uh, there's a remarkable degree of experimentation uh, with uh, Marianella, whose name I had on one of the slides. Uh, we've, we've looked at all 130 jurisdictions according to basic institutional characteristics, and one question we focused on in particular was the degree of bundling or unbundling of functions. A growing number of jurisdictions uh, are bundling prosecution, um, investigation into the same group in a ministry that would be called an executive ministry. They have to go to court to try their cases, but they achieve integration that greatly simplifies the treatment of these issues. The Department of Justice in the United States is a good example. Uh, uh, and I, our first panel on Wednesday mentioned that. Uh, DOJ does not have to go to a separate prosecutor. It has to go one floor down in the building. We are the prosecutor. Uh, it doesn't have to go to a separate group of in investigators. In a sense, it does the Federal Bureau of Investigation is a subunit of the Department of Justice. And even within, the, just because you put things in the same house doesn't mean they work well together. 
Uh, and indeed, they do not always work well together. But you have a unification of authority that means you have no constitutional problems associated with sharing information, deciding who acts, and deciding in particular what the relationship between the civil and the criminal enforcement would be. And if you study the DOJ framework, uh, they achieve a dramatic degree of simplification because ordinarily in thinking about the significance of leniency, punishment, you're talking to the one and only authority that will have the capacity to reach those decisions. It is an interesting complication when you go to our member states who have parallel authority and have their own laws that also in many instances allow criminal enforcement. I'm going to put that complication aside. But at the national level, that's a model of integration that uh, dramatically simplifies all of the questions you have. If you have a civil law regime, you will have an inevitable amount of complication. There's no way to get around it if you have criminal enforcement, either in the competition law or in the anti-corruption regime. And the only solution there is a lot of conversations that ultimately lead to interagency agreements that clearly specify who does what and makes clear to outsiders what the sequencing of decision making would be. But as I mentioned before, that takes a long time to develop because I think you can almost take it as a theorem. Take two public agencies, put them in the same policy domain in some respect, it is more likely than not that they will not work well together at the beginning. That that is a slow, uh, a slow growth over time. So um, I would say, I would say, yeah, and there's, there's an obvious additional complication if you have the unification I mentioned. I said executive ministry. You have questions about autonomy and independence there because the chain of authority through the executive ministry in the case of the Department of Justice goes to the White House. The President of the United States could call the Attorney General or the head of the antitrust division or the Federal Bureau of Investigation and say, thank you for your loyal service. I want you out of there by five o'clock. No, make that by noon. I want you out of there. And the only appropriate response is, thank you very much, Mr. President, for the opportunity to serve you. Uh, it's been terrific. I'll be gone. Uh, so what you get with that integrated model often is a degree of potential direct political control that can make one nervous. Now, at, at DOJ, historically, uh, there's a custom that said there's separation there. Uh, that's all up for grabs now. That's really hard to tell whether the custom will prevail. So uh, it, it's possible almost as though you were going to, to purchase an automobile. Um, and I can say this one has a bigger engine, it drives a lot faster, it uses a lot more petrol, and it's not really good for urban driving. Uh, this one has these other features. Uh, I think what we understand now better are the trade-offs, what each of these models does, uh, uh, what it takes to drive them effectively. But uh, I think, uh, I think you, you inevitably face limitations with each one that require a lot of additional effort once you put it in place to solve. And, and the, norm, the norm around the world today is administrative enforcement of the competition law. That's 80% that's of all jurisdictions, 80%. And many of them have decided to go criminal in some way on the continent, Chile, Brazil, Mexico. Uh, so, so you, 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 if you, if you take that step, you're going to be spending a lot of time building the bridges we talked about before. Obrigada. Temos uma última pergunta, doutora Carla. Bom dia a todos. É, minha pergunta em especial aos representantes que atuam na dimensão da União Europeia, especialmente ao doutor Paul, que falou ontem sobre os precedentes do caso Courage Manfredi. É, eu gostaria de ouvir se após a diretiva sobre reparação de danos, como é que ele percebe a questão da margem nacional de apreciação ou se ainda há uma espécie de fórum shopping diante dos eventuais critérios de quantificação das indenizações. Obrigado muito. A resposta é que há um enorme de fórum shopping. 
Uh, so, I mean, you've touched on a very important issue in the European Union, which is the fact that uh, you have 27 member states and each member states has a different uh, procedural system. The differences are huge. They can really affect the way that a case is determined and how long it takes to get a decision. Um, so there's a lot of forum shopping. Those rules are not determined by the directive, uh, just to be clear about that. They're, they're determined in regulations relating concretely the Brussels regulation in terms of jurisdiction. Uh, and so you can see um, people choosing uh, certain national systems which they prefer. The preferences to date have been the UK, Holland and Germany. That's been driven in part by uh, the funding that I described earlier. Uh, so that's an, important, uh, that's an important issue. The directive doesn't enter into forum shopping and jurisdiction rules, but it does attempt to flatten the, the playing field. So it attempts to harmonize certain rules around Europe to try to um, make the differences not so noticeable and to try to encourage claims uh, around uh, the European Union. So it goes into things like limitation, joint several liability, and it also addresses key issues relating to quantification of harm, which will impact the way in which national courts deal with these issues. So presumptions of harm, um, disclosure uh, will be, is going to be coming into a lot of the civil systems. Maybe already, uh, as a reaction to that, we're seeing with this uh, famous trucks cartel case, uh, it's the first European Commission decision where I think we're seeing claims in all, almost all the major uh, European jurisdictions. Bom, obrigada a todos. É, em nome uh, do, em benefício do tempo, a gente vai passar para o próximo painel. A gente infelizmente vai cortar o coffee. E uh, eu queria mais uma vez agradecer em meu nome, em nome do Ibrac, pelo, uh, uh, em nome do Ribas e do Léo, uh, pela presença de todos uh, e pela, pelas excelentes contribuições mais uma vez uh, do ponto de vista internacional. Obrigada.